Well, what a great pleasure to welcome uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Nerds On Site, David Redekop. Uh, lovely to see you, David. How are you doing? You're joining us all the way from Canada, um, and it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Aki. We have spring weather here. So for us, this is an exciting time of year because all of the April rain is uh, what generates a beautiful May and June and July. So we're excited about this time of year. Oh, that's wonderful news. Well, listen, I mean, your company is such an interesting company. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the COVID came at a time where I'm sure many of people have been using your service when you're looking at work from home. But tell us, as, tell us a bit about nerds on site as an IT business and as a res residential service provider. How have you guys evolved? Because you've been around for a while, haven't you? Yes, that's right. A quarter century. <laughs> I know... Uh, the age is apparent on me anyway, but uh, <laughs> when we started, uh, John and I co-founded the company back in 95, and uh, we realized that uh, service uh, needed to be done where the client is, right? The experience needed to be on the client premises where they have the comfort, where they know the environment. And, and at that time, connectivity was just brand new. In fact, it was one of our most common types of services just to provide basic connectivity to businesses and, and homes alike. And so it's just evolved uh, from there. But now that connectivity is more reliable than ever, even though <laughs> we still have plenty of reasons to complain, thinking that, you know, in some ways we had it better 20 years ago than we do now. Uh, the reality is, is that now that connectivity is as ubiquitous is, as it is, that so many of the services can be done remotely. So the on-site service is a lot less than it used to be. But that's still where the real relationship building happens is is in person when possible. Oh, fantastic. I mean, I remember using your services many, many years ago, and it was, you know, uh, setting up a, a modem uh, plugged into an ADSL router, you know. Uh, um, I mean, that's that's going back a long time now, but I guess things have evolved and uh, the world has evolved. Uh, and, and, and your services have, have evolved as well. I mean, I... I know that now cybersecurity is top of your list as it is on top of every corporate's list. Um, it's probably the one big thing that we all have to contend with, right? That's so very true because what's happened is the ubiquity of connectivity everywhere and multi-home devices where the default behavior is that there's no restriction in terms of what the device can do to go online has literally become or exhibit itself as a fertile playground for malicious actors, cyber criminals. They have a playground that's way bigger than they ever dreamed possible. And so if you couple that with a couple of other things, one lack of morals that guides you to do the right thing. And secondly, a very real economic divide between the haves and the have nots. Um, if it comes down to me providing food on the table for the family that I love, um, and I have to choose between between having no work or doing criminal work. Most of us never had to make that choice that live in the protection world. But the reality is, is that there are people <laughs> in the world for whom that is the choice. And we see this now with some of these YouTubers that focus on uh, catching the criminal in the act. In some of these are heart wrenching stories where the uh, cyber criminal at the end of the day, honestly, was just trying to provide food for his family. So it's a difficult time. But mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that those of us who are fighting cyber crime are going to continue to fight it and uh, hope that those that um, have an opportunity to provide folks like that a better way of life will do the same so that going forward, we leave uh, the next generation in a better place. Yeah, and it certainly has been on the increase since the pandemic has started. I mean, criminals are looking at new ways of attacking systems, attacking personal computers. Um, how, how did the pandemic impact your operations? That's a very good question, Aki. When the pandemic first started, uh, obviously many of us were extremely nervous about what the impact would be of this. So the first several months definitely impacted us. But within about 90 days, we had retooled a lot of the things that we used to do on site to being where it's the equipment is centrally staged, centrally prepped, uh, pre-configured with a very short list of instructions, step one, step two, step three, and you're up and running in, you know, with tools like um, video conferencing and FaceTime, 
um, it is possible to then have remote hands and eyes where the client's IT uh, contact or the assistant, a technical assistant that's on premises at the client location can work with an expert at the other end of a video-based call. And, you know, you don't get quite the real sense of comfort. Like if you and I were breaking bread together, mm. it would be better than video. But video is second best. And what it allowed us to do within 90 days, many in our industry were right back to where we were before. Um, and that's just not just nerds on site, but that is right across the industry of what my finding is with other associates. Okay, now that's that's really interesting. Now, looking at, uh, you know, uh, businesses and, you know, many businesses are facing challenges. There, there are remote workforces. Everybody's had to adapt pretty quickly. Um, how can nerds on site help these businesses uh, with their IT requirements? And, and I guess that the IT requirements that people needed before the pandemic are very different to what they are during the pandemic. That's right. They really are quite different. Uh, before the pandemic, most of us really did end up going to a physical office uh, for most of the kind of work that uh, right across a number of industries, right? And so there's inherent security in your work being at a workplace where you have the traditional edge firewall, right? You have your security boundaries that all of a sudden became extremely flexible or were just completely erased because now laptops and even desktops were taken home on a semi-permanent basis but now they didn't enjoy the IT and the security focus that uh, existed on the corporate network because home networks by their very nature can't be secured and still have your Xbox work or have be secured and still allow Fortnite for your kids to play so you have to almost bring a, like an enterprise class networking to the premises. Either that, or you apply the zero trust model to a mobile device so that it is safe for that device to use an unsafe network, if you will. And so the needs are so completely different because now, the because of the increase in cybercrime, the insurance companies have now also been become much more proactive in terms of their requirements for you to continue to have cyber insurance. And many small businesses don't even have cyber insurance, but they're trying to be proactive about their own risk, ex their own exposure uh, overall. And so they're recognizing that when you take a computer off premises, there's all kinds of threats that would otherwise not be there. So the need now is just adjusted to travel with the more dynamic nature of a company. And as they're moving at the same process to the cloud, we see the record uh, quarters and years that the big cloud companies have had, that has just been accelerated. So the whole digital transformation that we've been talking about over the past almost decade now just became accelerated. It's a good thing that so many of us and our clients were already semi-prepared and that we knew that you know, the digital transformation was coming but now it just accelerated. Hey, that thing that we were going to do over the year, we're going to do it over two months. Wham. <laughs> and just yeah. like that, a lot of companies got digitally transformed and moved their services to the cloud where collaboration was better. You know, so many typical accounting practices were done on premise. Databases were big. It was clunky and needed a fat client on a PC. And when all of a sudden, yeah, all of these cloud offerings become available, um, then it makes it so much more practical just to say, now is the time for us to make this switch very quickly. And then you can have a bookkeeper at one site, an accountant at a different site, uh, someone else that's doing uh, clerical work at a different site. You can have sales teams elsewhere and they get together, get on the same page over video conference. And so that a lot of our efforts have been around facilitating the needs of being a mobile business warrior. Now, um, you know, we cannot talk enough about security. And uh, I think, uh, as you, you and I have both mentioned, security, wherever you look, whether you're working from home as a small business, as a big corporate, you know, security is going to be the biggest thing, I believe. Uh, well, one of the biggest things going forward. Um, and you mentioned zero trust earlier. And I just think it's important to highlight zero trust and explain what zero trust is. Yes, absolutely. See, we have this long history of the internet when it first started, and it was designed by some incredible minds as a fundamental building blocks that just built on top of each other. And then the fact that the foundational building blocks were so large and so flexible 
really is a testament to what became possible as a result of that. Those early minds are just just amazing, and, and, and I marvel at the forethought that they had that when I look at things today, I'm amazed that things actually even work. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because there's so many places where it could fall apart. But one of the core elements, one of the core DNA components, if you will, was that it had to survive any interference. And so when you build a network based on the premise that, hey, we're going to route over around any obstacle, and that remains a core tenet of it, it's only a matter of time before the malicious actors, the cyber criminals, recognize, well, wait a minute, we can use that to our advantage. If only we can provide an implant via an email attachment or a malicious link or a USB flash drive that lands on a corporate network, then we're going to use that resiliency of being able to get out to reach the command and control operator. And then we can continue to take the next stages, move laterally, you know, escalate our privileges inside the systems until we're at the point where we can ransom the data for some money and execute ransomware. Ultimately, that is the most common way for criminals to get paid um, because of that. So what about zero trust? So zero trust now takes the approach to say, instead of us allowing anything by default, we disallow everything by default until there is a proven trust relationship. And so zero trust is a concept that spread across a number of domains, a number of areas of expertise inside of technology. It's not just about zero trust when it comes to authentication, but also zero trust network access, meaning that when this phone of mine joins uh, a network, that anything that it tries to do outbound wise is distrusted by default until the destination is a, and the source is a trusted relationship by some kind of third party. It has to be out of band. It has to be third party. It has to be where you start with nothing and then you add what's necessary. Hmm. And by taking the zero trust approach, you really are capping the criminals at the knees. It is still possible for them to have a dropper, a malicious piece of software that somehow lands on a computer with a vulnerability. But if zero trust is applied through and through, then that thief is trapped in there and cannot do any damage. And okay. so we are big believers in zero trust, um, and that is the way forward. It's a big change in terms of thinking, but once an organization, starting from the leadership or from grassroots up, if if they if they have if they're incentivized or they have a stake in the organization, move towards this direction, we can really get back to the point where building a business in uh, whatever the niche that a business has is exciting and they don't need to constantly be thinking back on how to secure, secure myself. Do I have the right fences around me? Do I have the right security guards here, right? Building business is so much fun when you don't have to constantly be worried yeah, about security. Absolutely. I'd like to get back to that. Absolutely. And, I, and, and it's so important what you raised because it's a complete mind shift on how we did computing a decade ago when you guys started off you know the, the threats were very very different to what they are today today they're a lot more real and they can literally cripple a business if you don't have those proper fundamentals in place and that approach that you talk, talk about uh, that zero trust approach well you've had a very exciting 25 years i mean what's next uh, for for your organization uh, where, where where do you see um where do you see you guys going or nerds on site where are you going to be in the next 25 years Oh, it's, a, it's a long way. It's question. a long way to think. So maybe we should chunk size that and say in the next five years, because IT and computing is evolving at such a rapid pace. It's so difficult to look so far ahead. But five years from now, where do you see nerds on site? Well, if I can make this a little bit personal, um, um, my wife and I are blessed with five sons and uh, our oldest son is uh, 17 years old. And Five years from now, well, it's quite possible that uh, one, two, or maybe even three of our sons will somehow be involved in technology. And so part of uh, a success of any father, I think, is to see what uh, the next generation does with the foundation that you've built. And I come from a long lineage of um, really, really strong uh, male uh, role models and uh, mothers and female role models 
where it was about generational thinking. It was about what are we leaving for our grandchildren type of mindset. And so part of me always thinks about what are we handing off to them? Are we handing them off the, the world off to them so that it's a better place than we found it? Or are we making it worse? And so in that line of thinking, um, we do have some very exciting opportunities that uh, are exhibiting themselves in this rapid change where the world is moving towards greener uh, sources of energy. And those greener sources of energy need connectivity, they need security, they need uh, cyber awareness, they need all of that. So it's a burgeoning industry. Uh, we have more and more things that we can centralize uh, because of the power of, uh, of the internet and connectivity. Um, in, but at the same time, we'll always need a nerds on site. So the industry itself is morphing slowly when you look at it from a year by year basis. But uh, I think it was Bill Gates who years ago said that we always overestimate what we can do in a year. But we always underestimate what we can do in a decade. And so similar kind of thing happens in five years. When I think back five years, and if I had been able to forecast where we'd be in five years, I would not have predicted mm. this degree of cybersecurity need in the industry when literally 15%, uh, uh, up to 15% of the global GDP is now going to uh, cyber criminals and or cybersecurity. Can you imagine how much better we could do if we could just <laughs> eliminate the cyber criminal out of it and find a way for those that are legitimately trying to, you know, feed their families just to use that time productively. And so I don't know if that is give, gives you a concise enough answer. No, that's the kind of the direction that I think we're headed. No, I, I like it. I like what you mentioned, David. I guess I guess that we, nobody knows where the future is going to be, but what we do know is that. IT has become very complex and it's not something that a small business owner or a medium sized business or a large business can can do on their own. You know, they need that external help. The guys uh, like yourselves who come in, who know what needs to be done so that the business owners can focus on their core functionality, which is running their business. And I guess that's where your strength lies and will continue to lie going forward. So David Redekop, thank you so much for joining us, co-founder of Nerds On Site. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, sir. We wish you well. And uh, I look forward to chatting to you in the next, uh, well, before the next five years and see, uh, we reflect back on our conversation. And I think, I suspect that we will still be talking about security in five years from now. I believe we will. Thank you very much for having me, Aki, and all the best at uh, my broadband conference. Uh, pleasure being with you.